Come on, go! My name's Tim. I'm a musician, a car collector, an automotive journalist, and a lover of all things automotive. I've bought and sold collectible cars for two decades, and I hope my experiences and my point of view helps you find the car of your dreams. As an automotive aficionado, there's nothing that gets me going more than automotive delicacies that we were deprived of in the United States. I have a real proclivity towards those cars that we were deprived of, and I also have a real love for Italian flair. This Fiat 16 valve coupe is where those two things intersect. There's nothing to compare with the way it looks or the performance of that engine. To get into a Lancia Delta Integrale, is significantly more money than you're gonna outlay on one of these cars. I'd be proud to have one of these cars in my garage. Someone is gonna have the only one that I'm aware of in the United States uh, in the near future. Number one cool fact about this Fiat Coupe is that it's built by Penn and Farina. After the production of the Elante ended, Penn and Farina had an open plant, a place where they could manufacture cars. In that plant is where the Fiat Coupes ended up being made. If you watch my Scirocco video, you get that. I think that's a cool aspect of the Scirocco, that it's a Carmen Coachworks car. I think that whole Coachworks, Coach Builder, really brings something to the car. And I think as these cars now go up in value, uh, particularly in this segment, I mean, this car kind of slots into the, the coupe, the performance coupe and hot hatch segment because it's a front drive turbo car. But the drivetrain from this car being shared with uh, what is now a very valuable collector car, and I would say even an exotic car, the uh, Lancia Delta Integrale, this four cylinder turbo, which makes around 190 horsepower. And at that time, that was a good amount of power. The car feels very powerful. Uh, you've heard me say before that power plants sort of have either a thoroughbred feel or kind of a cheap feel. Uh, this car has a thoroughbred feel, and I think it's due to that, to that engine. Interesting design features abound, and I think it's one of those cars that you're gonna see going up in value pretty quickly over the coming years. There's not ever going to be a lot of these in the United States. In fact, since we've had it here, it's been quite the conversation starter, as you can imagine. And if you buy a car like this, you're probably gonna be the only person at your Cars and Coffee with a Fiat 16 valve coupe. You can have your Fiat Coupe with a variety of engines, but I think the ones to have are the 16-valve turbo 4 or the 20-valve 5-cylinder. In fact, I think the 16-valve has a little bit of an advantage. The car's exterior design was done by someone who would go on to pen quite a few interesting and controversial cars, a gentleman named Chris Bangle. The Fiat Coupe had a variety of engines, and I think this is the one to have. This is the Lancia Integrale engine. It's a 16-valve, four-cylinder. It makes plenty of torque. It has a very charismatic power delivery, and one that I think suits the car very well. And putting a little more weight out over the front axle, I don't think is prudent. This engine is very tunable, can make more power. I think makes really good power for where the chassis is at in this car. And this chassis is one that underpinned a lot of Fiat and Alfa Romeo cars at the time. A lot of performance cars shared a platform with this Fiat. The thing that's most striking about this Fiat that you'll notice is the styling. Chris Bangle did a great job, and I think there's a lot of nods to designers like Giandini. Many automotive journalists at the time called it a budget Ferrari. And I think there's something to be said for that. The way that the lights are sunken in in the back is very exotic. These cut lines for the wheel wells, you know, they didn't have to go to that extent, but it is a very sculpted, beautiful car. And I think it's one that really, if you think about Fiat's now, I think you have to go to Alfa Romeo or Maserati to get anything that's even close to this charismatic. And if I'm honest with you, I think it's more charismatic than anything Maserati has made in this current generation of cars. So now that it meets the 25 year criterion, it's a compelling car to import and one that I'm fascinated by. A good friend of mine imported this along with several other cars. And I think it's one of the most interesting cars you can put in your garage for under $20,000. And I don't think these cars are going to sit at $20,000 very long because to find one in this condition is somewhat exceptional. If you go around the car from the headlights to this mirror to the taillights to the interior, 
everything is exceptional on the car. It doesn't have anything that says Econobox, even though it's a front drive platform. So take a minute to just walk around this car with me. From wheel design, which I think is pretty compelling. I mean, look at these wheels. This mirror, it's tiny, it's beautifully sculpted. You've got this sharp cut line, and it's not just a cut line, it sort of echoes that Chris Bangle design that he became renowned for. Then we get to door handles. It's a cool door handle. Interior. Pen and Farina laid out the interior of this car and it doesn't stop with just the dash and those sorts of things. It's even the pattern of these seats. Look at the pattern of these seats. How fantastic is that? The logos, the cut lines. Then you get to these tail lights. That's taillight perfection. Inset taillights are sort of a hallmark of Lamborghinis, Ferraris, other really exotic cars of the era. One of the things I love about the Skyline, this sort of superfluous rear wiper. Same thing with this car. Do you need a wiper on the back of this car? Probably not. It's not, it's sort of a redundant thing that you don't need, but cool that it's there. To the gas cap. And this gas cap is functional. There's not an additional gas cap under here. One thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, a lot of hot hatches, people updated them with short shift kits. This car could use a short shift kit in that definitely isn't the most feelsome shifter from this vintage. But then you get to the nose. I think that's where this car shines, maybe more than any other. You have the, the headlights reminiscent of the NSX, obviously, with the inset fog lights. But I think this is a mean front end. Check it out. Gorgeous, gorgeous design. Probably the coolest design element on the car overall is the way that that front end establishes sort of aggression, but then it's echoed all through the car. One other thing is overall it's round, has rounded uh, features that were very common in this era, but check this cut line on the rear fender. You get this very cool flat surface flat plane that echoes all the way, this crisp line that echoes all the way across there. I really like that. So a lot of cool elements, the way the exhaust exits the car. So as you can see on the inside of this car, there's Pin and Farina badges and Italian flair is the uh, recipe to make anything better. The engine in this car and the styling, I think, are the two highlights. Uh, the styling of this car is arguably the best looking front drive car ever. To, to sort of judge this and say, you know, does it have the world's best steering feel? Well, no, it doesn't have the world's best steering feel. But in terms of power, this car delivers all the power that the tiny front tires can sort of muster with pretty amazing grace. Not a lot of torque steer, not a lot of the negatives that you get from heavily powered up front drive cars. I always wanted to drive one of these cars. Is it as good as I thought? Yeah, I think that the reviews and like performance car uh, and Evo and Car Magazine back in the day. Uh, got this car pretty pretty square on the head. Um, it does have a lot of things going for it. And I think it's certainly one of those cars that it, it's a shame we didn't get in this market because it, it has, as I mentioned earlier, sort of the Gandini, uh, even though it's not designed by Gandini, but the Gandini uh, wheel arch look. And, and it's very, has a very exotic look very interesting looking car in a fairly inexpensive uh, package. In terms of a collector car, particularly here in the United States, finding a great one of these, I mean, just having it parked in your collection, it is an interesting looking car. And the way that hood opens, you know, with the hood open and that engine on display, 
it's something uh, to really be appreciated. So it isn't all about driving dynamics. Is this the best front drive uh, vehicle on the market? No, definitely not. Is this the most compelling high performance car on the market? Certainly not. But it also isn't priced like one and there's nothing to compare with the way it looks or the performance of that engine. Bottom line on this car, Fiat delivered the goods. They brought a car out with really evocative styling. One that even to this date is still not bettered in that hot hatch or small coupe segment. In fact, there really isn't a huge small coupe segment. This car stands alone. With only around 72,000 of these cars being made and none of them coming to the United States until now after the 25 year rule has been sort of passed up, these cars are always going to be rarities. Even more so with the turbocharged, four-cylinder 16-valve engine with its racing pedigree and its powerful turbo surge. The 20-valve five-cylinder is also unbelievably rare, and who doesn't love five-cylinder noises? But these two cars, whichever you pick, neither is the wrong answer. Life is too short to drive boring cars. As we ebb ever closer to the potential end of the internal combustion engine. What an amazing era. And these cars, the force fed turbo cars with histories like the Lancia Delta or this Fiat Turbo Coupe, why not have something super compelling? I hope your garage already has something really interesting in it. If not, it's never too late to own that childhood dream car.